All right, well, welcome back to Along the Road. Uh, we are excited to continue our conversation this week uh, on our political gospel book. Uh, but before we get started, just to let you know, I'm Pastor Josh here at the First Congregational Church in Kingston. And I'm Katie Johnson, the Children's Discipleship Director at Kingston Congregational Church. And each week we like to come to you and talk to you about our faith and how it intersects with life. Uh, right now we're focused on a particular book because our church is doing a book read. And uh, many people have been reading through this book chapter by chapter, and we're sharing it as well. Uh, we've gone over chapter one and chapter two, and you can go back and look at those. You can drop a comment about those if you want. You know, the way of the kingdom and the way of the dove, it's uh, one way to look at it. Uh, we thought of the themes of submission and subversion and how they're opposites, but yet we must live in the tension and have both of them. And so, <laughs> so we walked through a lot of that and a lot of the idea that as a Christian, you do have a politic. And the, the, the definition of that is how we arrange our life and what we do with that. And I think that was important for us to understand that a politic will do that. You know, it's how we arrange life. It's what we do. And um, it's not just who you vote for. And, and that's different. And I think that's the premise of the book is that we are political people, whether you like it or not. If you choose Christ and you live in a community that chooses Christ, that alone is a political statement. Mm -hmm. um, and it would have been in the time of Christ even probably even more so because they didn't separate religion and politics the way we do. And so, yeah, he's gone over these two chapters. Yeah, because if you if unless you want to live in chaos, right, you need some kind of format to live under. Right. Socialism, communism, yeah, you name it. Yeah. But those are all politics. Republics. Democracies yeah. and monarchies, and oligarchies, all, all oligarchies, oh. <laughs> all the things. You know, you, you you do. You need something, and then the idea that Christ ushers in a new kingdom, which is a monarchy, mm. uh, is is a political statement. That's right. That we will follow this king who has initiated his kingdom and will come someday to fully establish it. Mm -hmm. And so you make a statement in that just by the way you live. Um, and so you, you, in some ways, are subversive, where you're against the rulers around you because you have a ruler above them. And he mentions that uh, the way I saw it was uh, the bigger umbrella of Christ has the authority over the Caesar or over somebody else. And so because of that, I must honor the Caesar. I must do these things. Uh, and, um, but that's the submission part. But when Caesar says, you must claim me as Lord, that's a subversion part. I, I can't. I can't cross that line and right. there are other parts like that. So those were the first couple chapters. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, all that's great for the time of Christ. <laughs> and I think what he's trying to address and help us see is in chapter three, what does that begin to mean here and now? Yeah. And so as we open chapter three, and you can follow along if you have the book, um, it's just called Reimagining Politics with Jesus, Submission and Subversion in Our Modern World. And... Um, you know, he lays out the scene of a gathering of people, uh, family members, and, and they are talking about um, some problems in society and what to do about it. And, of course, you know, we, we're in January right now, so we would have been coming out of a lot of family gatherings. And, mm -hmm. and you can be a wonderfully fun family, but have very diverse ideas on how to do this, or even political affiliations on how to do this. And it seems so in his story. As a matter of fact, at one point on the ne on the second and page sixty, he says, "Tensions rose, and we both sided. We both said things we regretted." So they were talking about a topic and trying to promote their own way, or at least we should do something. And uh, and it got out of hand. And I think that's something that maybe you've been into. I know you know. I, I, we all, or we try to avoid, right. like the plague. <laughs> like the plague. That. Yes. And um, the interesting thing is, his very next line was, "Our anger." reveals our loyal loyalties, but which is very interesting. So if we have a fractured relationship because of politics, we need to ask ourselves if we're placing too much hope on political promises. Mm. And I think he's saying that to himself. He wasn't saying which side was right or wrong. No, that's right. He's saying that to himself and to the other side, to anybody, that if that if you get that angry, that you have a fractured relationship. And, and that's very true today. A lot of people are like, I don't talk to that family member. Or we were friends and not we're not anymore. I left that church because somebody had a different political view than I did. Mm -hmm. um, then you have to ask yourself, are you putting too much hope in political promises? So I, I'm just wondering, do you see maybe modern day in our world that people put a lot of hope on the political promises? Or, or um, 
I guess I don't see that myself, but I've heard about it. Um, right. right. Whole congregations that lean one way or the other, that mm-hmm. it's preached from the pulpit or whatever. And the other thing that it makes me think about is, for instance, the Civil War. Yeah. And how that divided families. It did. And, you know, that, that's not modern day, but it's also not biblical times. No. no so, not. and I think probably Vietnam did the same thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you got to remember, even in World War II in Germany, you had the problem with that. And, and the church that sided with the Nazi political party. Yeah. Um, that's right. and, and And those that didn't. You usually have both sides there as well. Mm-hmm. So he talks about this idea um, that we want to try and keep peace. But we also don't want to, that there are those that there are those that try and keep the peace, and then there are those who are just going to like take their stance and be like a bulldozer and knock everything down. Yep. They will shout you down, they will yell you down, whatever it does, and they will knock over any friend in, in the process because yep. that political idea or ideal or, or thought is more important than anything else. Right. And and you're putting your hope on that. And so either one is something you got to be careful of. So he says, with all this, we're tempted to turn to one of two extremes. We tend to go one way or the other, and he mentions nationalism and nonconformity. So he defines Christian na- nationalism as the manifest itself in thinking the rule of God and government's authority are closely aligned. So since God is above our government's authority, then they must be closely aligned. So I will just toe the national line. I, I will follow what it says, and I will go this direction, um, and and we will... We will go. The example he gives is modern day. He says there are people when there was language when they said Trump at the time when this is Trump is God's instrument. Mm -hmm. Well, if he's if he's elected, he's God's instrument, and um, and then they would go as far as to say opposing Trump is uh, or his reelection is satanic. You know, and so he's not arguing for either one of those, but he's saying that's that's the the distance of nationalism. Mm-hmm. You know, and even today, now you have Trump is in office, and of course, we're here. This is the day of this recording. We're doing our New Hampshire primary. You know, <laughs> you know. So, what's going to happen next? But there are people that would still say either one of these. There, there are people I've heard that are both. Well, God put Trump in office, so we have to trust that, uh, and hopefully, it will bring him back. And then there are people I've heard that say, "Well, Trump is only Satan's instrument." Like they go the uh, total opposite way. Yeah. Um, so, so we, we, we need the nation to be in the right place, as if it's the nation that gives us the hope of what we're doing. Um, Our nation, one nation, as we tend to say, under God, indivisible, you know, so... so the language so is there, isn't it? We put language in there, you know. We were a, a Christian nation. I don't think we ever really were a Christian nation. We were a nation that believed in God. Um, at least the founders did, but not all of them did. Not all of them would claim Christ alone. Uh, as savior, they just claimed the deity and the freedom to exercise your faith. Mm-hmm. You know, so so you you raise the national idea uh, higher than it should be because you say, well, God has ordained this, and so you lift it to that part. Um, well, and I mean, we talked about last week that God does ordain government. He does, right? And so so it's just taking it one step too far. Yeah, he ordains it, so I have to agree with what that government does. He does it, you know, and. And well, that's then who's you, there. And I have to support it. And I have to go with what it says. Yeah. And, and if you're not, or if you're against it, well, then you are against God. And and I don't I don't think even in Paul's time or the time of Christ, you know, he he wasn't telling people to go up against Rome, but he wasn't agreeing with Rome. We don't. We like it cut and dry, don't we? We do. Here's the box. Yeah, it's if very you're gray. Out of the box, then right. Yeah. And that's why he said that's an extreme. Mm-hmm. And then the other extreme is the nonconformity. And so he defines that, and he says, in this view, religion and politics should not mix, because politics is public reality and religion is a private reality. And I, I have, I think I see both of these extremes everywhere. A lot of people, especially I think this one is, is easier for people. I keep my faith private. My politics is out there, whatever, you know, that's a public thing, I have, but my faith is private. It also keeps the peace. Mm-hmm. You know, so I don't get into arguments. I don't get into to exchanging these ideas, and he, and what it creates in that in that world, he says, it creates separatism, uh, monastery mindset. And I think of the monastic times in the early church, or you know, within two, three hundred years after Christ, people were not pleased with the politics, not pleased with the government, but didn't think they should be involved. 
Mm-hmm. That's how monasteries came to be. They were separating themselves from all of that as a private reality of their faith and spending and devoting their time unto God, but never involved in the community at large. Unless sometimes they fed the poor. They would feed the poor. We have like St. Basil. St. Basil did a lot of that work um, uh, uh, in, in Cappadocia, and he did. A, he was one of the founding fathers of someone who would uh, basically like these missionary hospitals. Yeah, St. Francis too. St. Francis would have been that way. He yeah. came after St. Basil. So you have that. That, that type of work, community mm-hmm. work in that sense, but but not not getting involved in government. They were doing it on their own. They weren't involved in the community. Yeah. People could come to them for help, yep. and it's private. This is mine. So so we have that mindset. Uh, and it, it kind of caught me. He said that we are advocates for the kingdom, and we do this. And he says that there are some people that, that even say it's so much sm- so that I won't speak any politics, uh, even from the pulpit, you know. Um, and so we'll get to that later because I lean that way in some ways. Yeah. Not in the way he's talking. I see where that is, but, um, you know, how we separate that in the pulpit or when or why we speak those words, I think are important to think through. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was challenged in that later on in this chapter, but he says, neither of these views, nationalism nor nonconformity actually conform to the way Jesus operated when he was on earth. Mm -hmm. And so what do we do? You know, he says... We, we have to work up from the foundation rather down from the issues. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. And I, yeah. it, that just changes your whole mindset. Yeah, we always aim for the issues, aim for the issues, aim for the issues. Because they're obvious. They're very obvious. <laughs> you know, we, we and, and, and I just wrote here in my notes, I just wrote, you know, we put the cart before the horse. Mm-hmm. And it's something even as elders at our church here, we're working on reimagining, not reimagining, we're coming back and, and making sure our statement of faith is right, our our mission is right, and we want to we want to come back to everything being through that filter first. Not what are we doing, and then let's check. Mm-hmm. And so we want to go through this filter first. What exactly do we believe? What are our distinctives in what we believe? That that the little bit of definition to some of the gray areas as well, mm-hmm. and and that makes us who we are. Now we move forward with issues. Now we move forward with other things. Right. If 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 our foundation is firm yeah. and acknowledged. Then we have a better springboard. Right. So he, he puts out that first we must imagine that the political world, the governments, they are God's servant. So we do need to honor them. Mm-hmm. And I like the word honor as opposed to just straight obey. Maybe it's just me. I'm a rebellious person in that sense. <laughs> I, just, uh, I always like going against the grain if I can. But honor them is important. Um, if it just said obey, then, then they could lead us down some pretty dark paths. Right. You know, so so he says we can do this because Jesus saw uh, that that we should view governing authorities as as his servant. Governments come from God, mm-hmm. and so he even marks that when he exi- you know speaks of what belongs to Caesar, Caesar's what belongs to God is God. He's showing that authority. He said that these governments exist because God established them to promote the common good, order, justice, virtue, peace. Of course, they're human, so. They, some do it well, perfect. some don't do it well, some <laughs> really perfect. do it bad. Uh, yep. <clears throat> but he mentioned some places in Scripture, in Isaiah and in 1 Timothy, where honoring them challenges the political posture of nonconformity. You have to still honor that. And, and I remember in, we'll probably do it here, but I remember in my church in Iowa, we had a we had a, a display in our church. And we had the American flag there and so stuff there. Uh, at one point, the display was meant for the uh, the veterans. So we just wanted to thank mm-hmm. the veterans that we had. And then, you know, when that time ended, I moved, changed that display, and someone had to cut out of the U.S., and we wanted to pray for our nation. And then we had listed there our president, our vice president, our governor, our mayor. So, so it didn't matter who it was. It didn't matter right. what party they were from. The yep. point is... We, we knew we were to pray for them. Mm-hmm. We knew they belonged under God. Mm-hmm. So they weren't up in the sanctuary, you know, up in the, uh, up on uh, where we preach from. They were back in the narthex. Mm-hmm. But it was a reminder to all of us, we need to pray for them. I think that's a good way to honor them. I didn't vote for this person, but God, you have them there. Mm-hmm. Help me know what is right. Help them know, help Give our nation. Give them wisdom. Give them wisdom, right. you know. Right. So when, the, I think this really kicks in, as he says, when the other party's in office, mm-hmm. other as in quotes, mm-hmm. we tend to get whipped into a frenzy. And right now I see it. Like right, that's what everyone tries to do right now. I don't I don't 
watch news very much. I try and avoid it. Right now, I really try to avoid it because you get whipping frenzies on both sides, oh, and it's absolutely. crazy. We think the world is ending, and there are people I've heard, you know, the two major candidates, Trump and Biden, it doesn't matter who it is, you'll find people that say, if that guy's in office, the world's going to end, and it, and it could be either one. It's almost like, are you taking the same script and just flipping the names? Right. Uh, but that's how it is. So in some ways, he says, it turns out we're all nonconformist. We're, we when we think the other guy's in power. Mm. If the wrong person's in power, we're willing, you know, to oh, you know, shake our head or to do something. So he says, if governing authorities are God's servants, what does it look like to honor, honor them in the modern era? I, like the one example I said where we pray for them. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. He says, we, we must find a way to show the way of the dove. Right. And I think that's hard, especially, he mentioned some things there in our social media world. Yeah. You know, there was a hashtag uh, at one point for, for one of the presidents that says, hashtag not my president. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're putting out very clearly that God has ordained this. It doesn't mean you have to agree with everything they say, agree, but no. but I'm not even going to honor that. My way is better than God's way. So this person's not even my president. Mm -hmm. um, at this level, it, it may look like a voice of frustration, but it, I think it means more than that. And he says, this is not how Jesus spoke of Caesar. That's right. I mean, think about that. And Caesar wasn't a voted-in type of person. No. No. <laughs> you know, so even though we have critiques of authorities, Jesus did as well. That's right. We can speak of the good they do and honor them, knowing that God put them there. Yes. And I, I think that's important. Yes. And I like the list that he had of ways that we can honor. Yeah, I think that, that comes up later, or maybe in there, too. Oh, yeah, he says... We encourage those uh, in our congregation who work for the state, and we have right. a couple in our congregation that do, mm -hmm. send thank you cards to senators and police officers. Just thank you. doesn't matter. Look up your list, whoever's in your local area, and just send them a thank you card. Vote for them or not. Scriptures affirm the organization of governing people is a good thing. Americans have much to be thankful for, no matter who's in power. And, right. and that's very true. That's, that's very true. You know, we have some friends long-term friends that have been that are ukrainians that are ministering there and um we have much to be thankful for and, and sometimes i wonder why we're not because and we don't see the other side we don't we don't see what's going on so <clears throat> yep and we can um if if the government asks us to do it we should do it as long yeah. as it doesn't specifically go against our faith yeah and that's important he, he brings that up you like know paying that, taxes like paying taxes, you know. And so if we learn to pray for our governing leaders, uh, I think what we might find out is we have to do some repentance for the way we've thought of them in a non-honoring way. That I, doesn't mean that, like I said, I'll, I'll repeat it over and over. It doesn't mean you have to agree with everything they do and everything right. they say. Um, and I think he mentions that coming out of, or going through the pandemic we did in COVID-19 kind of showed the grayness in some of that. Mm. There are, we have the freedom to gather, but then in places we're shut down. Right. So do you force yourself and say, well, we're a church, we gather anyway. Do you not? Do you find a balance? What do you do? And how do you do that in a way that is still a good witness? How do you do that in a way that, that is both submissive and subversive? Right. You know? That's that tension. And that's the tension and, and how you work that. And, and I'll tell you now, there are people in the way we, we did it. We had a, I think we had a blend of things of what we did here. Mm -hmm. There are people that left because of how we did it. Not for the gospel preaching, not for the ministry that was happening, uh, just for the, the political view on how you decided to, to manage and handle this, this situation. Sure. Um, the problem, he says, there's an overlap in these authority structures. We have God over us. We worship God alone. And you're telling us not to gather. God wants us to gather. And so we have to balance that out and figure that out. Um, so that's a gray issue. But I think it, it needs to come with much prayer. And a lot of, I had churches, church friends, not here, but uh, church pastors and stuff that had people that were really adamant in their congregations. Um, if we do this exactly this way, then, then we, we're all against God or we're for God. If we don't listen to the, the government, then we're doing what we're supposed to. If we do listen to them, then God put them there. We have to do everything they say, and, and you have this, this in-between place. And I think that's we what we don't he's like gray because yeah. it's uncomfortable. It is. He said no matter what one decides on this issue, 
Christians should in, imitate the posture of Jesus toward the ruling elite. He honored governing authorities. If this is not your first instinct concerning the government to honor them, then you should examine how biblical your political formation has become. And I think that was a powerful statement. When you think of your your governing authorities, you think of whoever is on that ballot, this this primary and then in November, if your first instinct is not, I need to honor them and pray for them, number one instinct, then you should examine how biblical your political formation has become. I think that's important because we, I think, at least in America, we put way too much on who they are. Mm -hmm. Too much for hope on what they're going to do or what we think our party will do or whatever it is. So the other thing is he, he reminds us is that they are not ultimate, therefore we don't rely on them. And I thought that was interesting that the life of Jesus shows that the civil governments and authorities are legitimate, they're needed, but they're not ultimate. Mm. They are not an eternal kingdom. They are not the creator of all things. They are not the ultimate end of all things. Mm. And I think the problem is that uh, most political, political theology is not balanced there. Mm-hmm. That, that's what he says. Mm-hmm. That we have a vertical uh, authority, which should be primary. And then the horizontal authority, those governments, which should be secondary. And, and Jesus affirmed the state's legitimacy, but also demoted them. What was Caesar's was Caesar's, but God's over him. So Caesar literally has been demoted below God's status. Right. But he's still honored, and then we have we follow him. <coughs> And so he talks about this and and, um, and uses Psalm 143 about how who we trust and, and that our trust needs to be on the Lord, but we tend to trust so many other things. Nobles and governments and horses and chariots over our armies, the strength of our armies. The things we can see. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So he says we've got to recognize these authorities, once again, are not ultimate. They will not establish full justice. They will get it wrong. They will get it wrong. Um, you may think they got it right and they may have gotten it wrong, but they're going to get it wrong. You know, They will not help all the fatherless and all the widows. They will not frustrate the way of the wicked. This is what Jesus does. You know, They will not do these things in the full and ultimate sense. Mm-hmm. I think all the way to the end. You know? Sure. Um, there is no American Savior. I love that line on the bottom of 66. There's no American Savior, only a Jewish one. <laughs> and uh, I said, yeah, we, we, yep. we think through, we, we think, especially in our American culture, it's so big. And we, we rescue the world. We do these things. Yeah. Our next president is going to be the leader of the world, all this stuff. And there's no American savior. Right. And in our minds, the ultimate is he who saves. So it says in America, currently the obsession with partisanship is killing the Christian witness. And too many of us are wrapped up in that fight. And, and I fully agree with that. I've thought that for a long time. A steady diet of political propaganda from our partisan networks and podcasts will not conform us to the image of Christ. And and I circled steady diet because I, I thought of like Moses and then God speaking to Joshua, Moses speaking to Joshua beforehand uh, in Deuteronomy. And then in, and I mean, yeah, in Deuteronomy and then again in, in the book of Joshua. Where the steady diet that Joshua is supposed to have is the word of God. Mm -hmm. But I know for a fact that many people, adults in our churches, their steady diet is one news line after another news line after another news line. And this political person, what they're doing, and this voting here, and and all, they're they're not just involved. That is what they are ingesting so much of. Right. Well, and it becomes addictive, too. And I think that's a very subtle thing Mm -hmm. that you're not aware of. Yes. And um, it, it just sends you down this path that um, the political parties have no desire to rescue you from. Yeah, it's true. So no, and and the further you are on their extreme, the more you're you're for them and, and rallying for them. Um, I think the bigger question is, what is conforming me to the image of Christ? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so. Uh, I did a devotional with my, my daughter the other night, and the devotional was talking about being unequal yoked. Um, and it just said, it doesn't mean you don't have friends that aren't believers. Right. It's, but who are the ones you spend the most time with? Do they encourage you to be more like Christ? Do they encourage you to, to be a better person? Do they lift you up? to it? And, and so 
I think, well, what a beautiful, you know, devotional for, for a preteen. But at the same time, what a beautiful thing for all of us, not just in the relationship, world. but in this political world. That's right. We're unequally yoked because we're so steeped in our, in our news cycle. We're so steeped in our social media cycle. And we're not as steeped in Scripture. Imagine if we spent as much time getting to know God's Word and spending time in prayer as we do to these cycles and to our phones and to our things. I think this book would be, would it be as groundbreaking to us? Right. It's just, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, he does say, let's be clear, politics do matter. You do vote. You do get out there. And, and you want to do that. And you need to be responsible and do your due yeah. diligence in investigating the candidates and yes. asking for yeah. wisdom, Lord, to help me to vote for yeah. the best one. But... Yeah. That's why he, he likens it. He says, religious belief has not replaced with, with partisan belief, but combined with it. So we have done what Israel did in the Old Testament. They didn't abandon the covenant. They drew in from the other worlds and the other gods, and they, and they combined it together. And he lays out that all of these parties have their founding fathers and their different people. He talks about FDR and he talks about the Constitution. Uh, and then he, he says this way, our leaders are viewed as secular priests. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought of that. And, and they are. <clears throat> yeah. And even though we never say it out loud, they sit in rooms of power. I've heard people say that. They have special access. And sure. they where we gather to hear what they have to say. We hang on their words. We become, as you just said, obsessed. And I think that's important. Um, you, you see that he mentions the, the passing of Ruth Gator, um, Bader Ginsburg uh, in 2020, but that there were people who never spoke to her or knew her that were in tears. Mm. She was so important. They, you know, it is like the loss of, of a priest to them, of a high priest. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, and, that that is where politics and religion had become one. But their God or their high priest was a human being instead of Christ himself. Yeah. And um, the whole thing he reminds us is Jesus Jesus gives us a different kingdom. Mm -hmm. It's not like this. Mm -hmm. Another kingdom was present uh, among these kingdoms. It was when in his time. And he, he puts it here. I just highlighted We serve another king. It means we have... That no affection we may feel toward a political tribe should compare to our allegiance towards Christ's heavenly king. And I think that's a good challenge to all of us. How you feel towards your political tribe, or left or right, or conservative, progressive, whatever word you put on there, should not compare to how you feel to how you are affiliated with Christ. And, therefore, it should not involve as much time. It shouldn't. As your exactly. allegiance to God yeah. does. Yeah. And so he, he moves from, from that idea of, of not they're not the ultimate, they're not this uh, that we have to lean on to. And now he says that we that they are that there's accountability to it, and so we can reform. A reform is, is a from the inside out type of thing. <laughs> he says the problem is that they often misidentify the good, these are governments and magistrates. They step outside of their sphere of authority. And they begin to call their citizens to false worship. And I think you can see that in from the local level government all the way up. You sure. know, um, they this is he goes, this is why we affirm the government's legitimacy. They do have a good purpose. And we also affirm the Jesus politically subversive message. Mm -hmm. um, remember, just because they are in a place to do good doesn't mean they always do good. No, because it Seems to me, and this is obviously a generalization, right. but the goal of politicians these days seems to be more to get reelected, yeah, than it is to serve the people. Yeah, well, I think now like I think I said, it's a leaders have always but. been that way in a general way, you know, because um, when Jesus comes, he announces the victory of his own kingdom. He says the Gentile rulers are tyrants. He claims their titles: Jesus is Lord, not Caesar is Lord. You know. He attacks the legion, as we read in the other mm -hmm. chapters. Uh, Rome is evil and no longer promotes good. And that's very true. Rome, as much as they were the whole world of peace, it was peace brought through being uh, strong Brutality. and brutal. Uh, they spread peace. They left a wake of death. They were terribly violent in war, killing people, raping, pillaging. 
Their forms of execution include sewing people inside animals, burying them alive, and crucifying them. But Rome's not alone. Every governing authority has atrocities that it has done, yep. including our own. Yep. Uh, and right. so America and all, the, all other nations, we all show deep corruption as well. So you could fairly say our government is corrupt. And it wouldn't matter who's in office. <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's just the nature of the it's beast. It's just the nature of the beast. You know, we, we have those issues. And so there is this idea that, that reform is part of it but I think the reform begins with us mm. and how we see things and what we do and, and even get involved like I said we have people in our congregation that are in the state government there's a pastor down the road who is also a state representative mm-hmm. and so there is a reform in that way pray for them too. pray for their witness and what they're doing um, and so he says uh, at the top of 70 so what should we do since we're in the kingdom of God how should we then live how should we then live? It's a great book, by the way. Yes. <laughs> um, should we march? Should we protest? Should we throw rocks? Uh, should we stock up on ammunition? All things I've seen people do yeah. in the name of Christ or in the name of their church and the political cause that they're leaning towards on both sides. The most subversive, subversive thing we can do, he says, is exist as the kingdom of God among the kingdom of men. Mm. Which is very interesting. That... that we need to live as the community of believers, the way God calls us to live. We can have more impact yeah. as a subculture. Yeah. Yeah, he says Jesus didn't seek to change the structures around the world. He preached an entire different politic, a different way. And so, just like the disciples, just like a church, a church is a gathering of vastly different people, from vastly different backgrounds that have one thing similar rescued by Jesus Christ. And what a thing it is. And what a thing it is. It's the new kingdom. It's the eternal kingdom. And now our job is to proclaim that to everybody. At our church, we use the word proclaim a lot. That's that's proclaim the good news. If we were a community that actually fully lived out every part of our church mission or the gospel mission to proclaim good news, to teach about Christ, and to reach that hurt and lost world, we were the ones helping orphans and widows, and we were the ones reaching out. We were the ones letting people know about this, Mm -hmm. um, that is a very subversive thing. Because in most worlds, let the government take care of the orphans and widows. Let the government help those that are in need. But Jesus says we do that because he has done that for us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very different. It's alternative politic manifested in the community believers we call, obviously, the church. I'm careful with the word because the church isn't a building. Right. It's a gathering of believers. Uh, he says, wherever a preacher preaches, he makes a political speech. So, standing up there and claiming Christ alone as Savior is a political speech. Although it's not we a, don't see it that It's way, not a vote we? Republican, vote Democrat speech. Right. It's just a political speech. It is, here is the kingdom that, that I am for. And I think that's important. Um, reminding you that Jesus is king. When you receive communion, you're re-pledging to that community. Sure. When you share the gospel with a neighbor, you're speaking like a campaign person. <laughs> it's interesting. For a Christian, political life begins inside the church. This is like our, our rallying point of the volunteers when you hear about, oh, well, I had our political campaign, and we had our campaign office, and they rally, and then they go oh, yeah. out oh, to sure. the community to get people to vote for their candidate. Door to that's, door. That's what we do when we gather. Mm. We remind ourselves who Christ is. We remind ourselves about the kingdom that we're a part of, not the kingdom of this world. Now go out and let people know about our kingdom. Do we want them not to vote for us? We want them to be rescued just like we are. Mm -hmm. You know, so Mm -hmm. he says the church is a political rallying point for God's people. And that's, you know, what he talks about. So he says in 71, our primary subversive political witness is to create a community that is loyal to the king, Jesus. So you have to make sure you put Jesus in there. Right. To that king. Which king? And to make all other political allegiances pale in comparison. Mm-hmm. So you can be a Republican, you can be a Democrat, you can be an Independent, but your allegiance to Christ, the King, should make that other allegiance almost disappear. You know, if someone says, oh, what are you registering? You can tell them. But they should know you as someone who speaks Jesus. Mm-hmm. Someone who promotes Jesus. Someone who promotes what Jesus has done for us. Not... 
this is who I vote for, this is who you vote for, this is this it, this political issue. That, which one pales in comparison? And I and I would venture to say that for a lot of people, maybe it's not politics, but the idea that something they speak about is way more than Christ is it, pretty normal. And here it says it should be the other way around. Mm-hmm. He says a political gospel subordinate to all other tribal instincts, you know, and so, and this will have what he calls a leavening effect upon society. It would actually lift up the world around you to speak of the hope that Christ brings. So that's why he says we can do secondary things, he calls it doing good for all in the works that we do. Um, he says at the bottom of 71, do we submit, do we, do we subvert and what does it mean to subvert and reform the state in the modern era? There are different forms of rebellion. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we must define what it doesn't mean. Right. Jesus explicitly said his kingdom was not of this world. If it were, his servants would fight. Rebellion, therefore, doesn't mean storming the capital. It doesn't mean looting buildings. Uh, we, advocate, uh, we advocate for the end of abortion, but we don't kill doctors who perform them. Right. It doesn't mean violence. It doesn't mean violence. You know, we... we we march in protest, but we don't form mobs of destruction. You know, and and you can see how all of that works out. Um, we don't harass public officials, mm-hmm. but we can still stand and speak the things that we're passionate about. Subversion doesn't mean violence. It's, it's very much a part of it. Um, and so he says that, that what we do is different, and how we do it is still different. Um, and I think that's interesting. I don't, I, I've never gone to march Think. I remember uh, in Iowa we uh, we had kind of like a sanctity of life campaign and mm-hmm. and and uh, myself and some other pastors you know we were concerned about uh, I think it was a, a Planned Parenthood in the, in the area uh, in our town and we didn't pick it against it or anything but we went and stood out in front of it uh, or in front of that area for about a month and we just prayed we didn't even have signs no signs, no anything. We stood out there and we prayed for a month, encouraged anyone to come with us and just come and pray. Pray for the people going in there. Mm-hmm. Pray for what is going. Pray that life would, would be, you know, the thing that is honored overall. Uh, and we prayed for about a month. Uh, and I don't know fully all the workings behind it, but about six months later, that place didn't have enough business and they weren't able to work anymore and they shut down the building. Wow. And so... I, I can see that as a version of this. Mm-hmm. We were submissive. We weren't rioting and yelling, and the, we we weren't even holding signs. Right. We are subversive because we were Im- imploring our king to do something about it, mm-hmm. and recognizing that he had full authority. And I remember in our prayers as pastors, we gather there, and hey God, if this is your will for it to stay here, it stays here. We get that. So then we prayed blessing on people in there, prayed whatever, whatever. It didn't matter. And so I see that as a mark of both of these things and how we do that. And sure. you, you can do it sure. that way. So yeah. the, the, the biblical, he says here, Christopher Bryant says it, that the biblical tradition subverts human order, meaning we understand who comes first mm. and, and where that goes. Um, and so he, he lays that out in different ways, um, that Jesus doesn't stop with what, what happens um, as, as corporate boards underpay workers, as there's public officials who, who serve the privileged few, and he goes through this list. And he goes, but Jesus doesn't stop there. He declares and enacts a completely new kingdom in word and deed. Kind of like the politician who does everything he says he's going to do. <laughs> That's an oxymoron. <laughs> that is an oxymoron. <laughs> you know, um, so we must declare and enact this alternate life as well. If we declare Christ, then we need to enact the deeds in our life as well. And, and how we see people as we do good. And I, I, I kind of underlined this thought. He said, we enact this as we do good to others and seek their welfare above our own. And those that's the way Christ operated. That's the mm-hmm. way of the kingdom. That's the way of, of the kingdom and the way of the dove. That's both of them coming together with your neighbor, with the co-worker, with you know, family members where tensions have risen before and words have been said. Mm-hmm. How do we do that? Uh, recognizing who is king, but also thinking of their welfare even above our own. You don't have to get into the fight every time because the fight is less important than understanding who's king and the rescue of who we are in Christ. And so he talks about that. He even uses uh, 
uh, MLK as an example mm -hmm. of what he did, and he had marches and rallies, but never crossed to violence. There was a, that was important to him. Mm -hmm. um, he, he says in 75, someone who participates in civil disobedience refuses to do what the government asks, but at the same time they remain under the rule of the government because they accept the consequences for their action. And I think that's ex a perfect example of Christ. Yeah. MLK did the same thing, and he went in prison. He was in prison. I, I deserve it. I broke this by civil disobedience, so I'm in prison. Um, and, and that's what he's trying to say. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so he says, we declare, in that, we're declaring the politic of Jesus and walking in both ways. So we can also work and help those living around us in, in that. So he brings it all together um, at the end of the chapter. He says that we tend to emphasize one over the other, sub subversion over submission. Mm -hmm. um, but the Bible brings them together. And he puts it this way, I had to underline it. Subversion through submission, conquest through peace, victory through suffering. And all of those seem like opposites. They do. And yet, that is how Christ operated. And that's how he asked our kingdom to operate. That's those who believe. So he says, we are not anti-government or pro-government. We are alternate government. That is, the government of Christ as king. Mm -hmm. And I don't think of it that way when I think of government. I think of right. what's happening in our nation, what's happening in this government here, and who's being voted. Like, I'm not anti or pro government. Christ is king. It's a totally different government, totally different governing. So there's no winning or losing. Yeah. You know, who was voted? No winning or losing. God has won in Christ, and that is the, the good news. Yeah. And so he, he encourages, and I would encourage you as you. Maybe some of you are going into your primaries, like ours, as we're recording is today, um, to remember, no matter what comes out in the end, God has won. And then to honor the one God has put in place. And that's that, that sometimes can be hard, uh, because you look at them, and, and I rarely see, especially the higher-end officials, that I think, oh, they're good models of integrity. It, it's just, but at the same time, that's who God has in place. Why do you think we have such a hard time? I think we have a hard time because in our hearts we want the king who is Jesus. And Jesus was integrity. He was honest. He was true. He was right. He was a good king. Now was, is, he is a good king. Mm -hmm. And and that's what our heart yearns for in, in leaders. Mm -hmm. But we're humans. We're broken. And power is something that, that does corrupt people. Uh, mm -hmm. and all across the board. Now, that doesn't mean that every leader in every government place is corrupt. But, you know, there are compromises we all have to make if, if you're in government or if you're in leadership. And you're, you know, it's just... The so, whole idea of being bipartisan, right? Yeah. Yeah, or in this case, other partisan, because it's Christ that we're looking at. <laughs> right. You know. But it's that idea of, yeah, there's two sides, but, and we've seen this, if yeah. they don't work together... Nothing, Nothing happens. happens. Nothing happens. So what's the point? Yeah. And then you get apathetic about it. Yes. And we don't want to do that. That's another extreme, too. That is another extreme. And so we have to remember that we we, we are not voting for the next kingdom. Mm. We are already, if you're a believer in Christ, you're already in the kingdom that will stand forever. The kingdom of Christ was here before America was formed. The United States of America will be here if the United States of America ever falls Kingdom of Christ will still be here. It was here before any other nations around here were for it. It it stands forever, and uh, and that is something I it's, I'm glad of because it can't be shaken. You know, it's not dependent on the stock market. It's not dependent on voting. It's not dependent on the weather. <laughs> the kingdom of Christ is dependent on one person, and that's that's Christ Himself. Right. And so, he says here at the end. Therefore, Christians are those that submit to and subvert the state. We do so because our kingdom is to come. But we can also hold them accountable for not rewarding the good and punishing the evil. And uh, he lays that out. He says we do this because we believe in showcasing the politics of our king. The state will, know, will not know what to do with Christians who act like this. It's very interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Look, like Jesus before Pilate, we might be yeah. brought before the governing authorities, but when they examine us, no charges will stand. Why? Because 
Christ's kingdom is not according to this world, and even though it will one day encompass this whole world. But they won't know what to do with us. If the church, if a church was, and, and it can never perfectly be a church, but if we were aiming towards this and living this out, I don't think the communities would know what to do with it. Mm-hmm. With the kindness, the love. Even you can disagree with someone's view on how to approach something and still love them. I mean, they wouldn't know what to do with that, especially now in these days. You know, and, and right. how, how we act. And so I look forward to what the next parts are, but that's where he brought the two way of the kingdom, way of the dove together, and how we, in this modern day, see how it plays out. It's not all black and white. It takes a lot of thought and prayer. And patience. And patience <laughs> and understanding and, and, and working out the gray. But it's centered on, on Christ as king mm-hmm. and his new kingdom. And then I think from there it's centered on those who believe gathering together and rallying. And that's what I see a lot of times our corporate worship is that time of rallying, bringing his word back up, bringing him back to the forefront of our minds, and now we go back out into the field. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly, if you look at it in our modern political world, that's exactly what they do. You rally at the, at the campaign site, now go out in the streets. That's what we're supposed to be doing sure. as, as followers of the king. And I, I say many believers are not. They come and they rally and it makes them feel so good and they're, they're ready for the week, but they don't go out and proclaim the kingdom. And that would change the world if we did. I really do. I, I think it would, um, especially in this season. Mm-hmm. So, Any last thoughts on that? I'll leave it to you on that one if you had any more. No, I don't think so. Um, I just, I think that we have to be brave and confront the, the gray. Yeah. And, and realize the gray is not going away. It's not. It's going to be there. You can't be one side or the other. You can't be the dove or or the the kingdom. Be both. You've got to be both. And so maybe as you go out the rest of this week, you should think through it. Am I unbalanced? Am I leaning one way or the other? Uh, do I have a politics so high that that my hope is there instead of my hope in Christ, even for the future of your own country? And so uh, find a way to get back into the tension. I like the, the idea of tension. Right. And what if, so if you want to watch a half an hour of news, balance it with half an hour of scripture. Scripture, scripture reading, um, gathering with people, mm-hmm. uh, having that as well. And I think mm-hmm. that's important. It's very important. So. Find your balance and know what kingdom you are a part of. I think that's the biggest part is knowing what kingdom we are. And then gather with those other believers. That's very important. Very important. So until then, you can always leave us a comment and let us know what you think. Or if you have questions, uh, we'll continue this uh, next week as well. And until then, you have a wonderful week.